name's Chris and I repair my own audio equipment and I also show you how to repair yours. So let's get started. I'm going to take you through the entire process of how to restore or repair a piece of vintage audio equipment. This Kenwood 5002 was produced in 1970. It's over 50 years old and there's no reason it can't be operating perfectly for another 50 years. So if you want your piece of vintage audio equipment to work like it was brand new, you need to know what transistors are troublemakers. You need to know what capacitors to change out. And more importantly, you need to know what to replace them with, as many of these components are no longer available. Add to that a surprise or two, and this video has it all. Here we go. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Well, there's still some deals out there. I picked this uh, KA5002 up my local flea market for $45. Couldn't plug it in, nowhere to plug it in. Uh, for $45 though, I wasn't gonna leave it behind, and so I brought it home with me. It's really quite full featured. It's a DC uh, coupled uh, power amplifier. It has two phono inputs, and the really cool thing, one of them is a low level phono input for a uh, moving coil cartridge. And so you can either use your moving magnet cartridge or your moving coil cartridge with this unit. Has two tape monitors, which is great. Has two set of speaker terminals. And it's really attractive. It's a nice looking amp. I got lucky with this one is the way I feel. Ahead, I'm going to show the power up of the KA502 on a Variac. I'm also going to talk about a dim bulb tester. I'm going to show the disassembly of the unit and how to get it apart and how to get it in a position to work on it. In addition, I'm going to show schematics and also how to identify if you have any troublesome parts in your particular unit. I'm going to show you desoldering tips as well as soldering. Along with all of that, I'll also go over Kenwood's interesting company history. I'll show you in detail how to install under the chassis capacitors to replace your filter capacitors. I'll show you how to find out any value of any capacitor that you may have. I'll talk to you about the deoxit products that I use. And last but not least, I'll show you the bench testing of this amazing little amplifier. The first thing you should always do, no matter what, is to just take a look at any new piece of audio equipment you may receive. I got this at my local flea market. There's no power at my local flea market. The guy didn't know anything about it, so I pretty much just bought it by looks. I took a look at it, it looked in good shape, and I brought it home. So, but still, when I got it home, I'm going to take a very close look at it before I do anything. Before I take the covers off, before I do anything else, I'm going to take a very good look at it. All the knobs are there. The back panel looks in good shape. It just generally looks uh, pretty nice. But that doesn't mean you just go run over and plug it into the wall. What I'll do now is I've given it a visual inspection. Now I'll bring it over to the test bench and go ahead and start to uh, remove the covers and just take a look at the inside also. Okay, with those two side panels off, the four screws in the top, and there's three screws in each side. I've uh, got those removed, so the cover should just come right on off. And it did, so that's good. And we'll go ahead and take a look and see what we can see. As you guys know, that's my main thing at first. This unit's unknown, so I'm going to take a look and just see if I see anything obvious. So I really don't see anything to take a look here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the unit upside down and take that bottom cover off and I'm going to take a look at that. Okay, I've removed the screws from the bottom and now I'm going to I think the cover should be loose. We'll take that off. Yep. Looks pretty good under here too. I think this is, you know, just as a first look, it looks all original. Looks very clean here down in the bottom, which makes sense, right? Because it probably sat with its bottom down its whole life. Now what I'm going to do is to power up this amplifier slowly as far as the line voltage is concerned. Here in the United States, we use 120 volts 
from our mains. And I have no idea how long it's been since this amplifier's been powered up. And so the safe thing to do is to power it up slowly and uh, reform some of these electrolytic capacitors. That's probably the biggest danger here are these electrolytic capacitors that haven't had a charge possibly in decades. So what I'm going to do is slowly power it up with this Variac. There's a knob here on the top and you can adjust it accordingly all the way up to 130 volts. Again, I'm here in the United States, so we don't want to go to 130. We do want to go up to 120, but we want to do it slowly. So that's what I'm going to do now is to uh, power it up. And what I'm going to also do is monitor the voltage. I do that with a multimeter because frankly, the Variac's got a little meter here in the front of it. It's not very accurate. It really isn't. It's, it's not very close at all. The Variac works great. It's the meter that monitors the voltage doesn't work great. Right now I've got the power off, and you should always do this with the power off. Sometimes I, I move them around with the power on, but you, there's obviously a lot more risk involved when you do that. And now I'm going to start walking this Variac up. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to just walk it up slowly, and I'll probably get it up at 50, 60 volts next, and let it just sit there if everything looks all right. I've got it up to about 60 volts, about 70. Hey, I don't know if you could have heard that on the microphone, but uh, I just heard a click. The relay just clicked. So it just came alive there, about 76, 77 volts. Give it a few minutes, let it run. As I said, I'm not a person who's going to go in here and wait hours or days to try to reform electrolytic capacitors because, frankly, they're all coming out, right? <laughs> you know me. So what are you trying to reform them for? Uh, so you can take them out here and... Uh, in a day or two. So ha having a Variac is nice. This Variac's fairly inexpensive. It's a 20 amp model, which is pretty much going to uh, satisfy most all uh, vintage audio equipment. We'll run off of this just fine. 70, 80, 100 dollars on eBay. So is it the first item I'd buy? No. First time I'd buy is like one of these guys here. Little digital multi meter. But saying that, if you get into this, you'll have a Variac. You'll use it enough to where you, it'll be worth that uh, 75 or or $100 to you. I think we can go right up to the 120. Well, there we are. About 119, 118. So she looks like she powered up fine. She's on the full line voltage. Now, having a Variac is very helpful to be able to power up a piece of equipment like this. And another tool I use is a dim bulb tester. And you can see I made this one. Um, I made this many years ago. And it's just with parts uh, that you can obtain up at Home Depot. They're easy to make. And they're just great protection for powering up any unknown piece of vintage audio equipment. And I'm not going to go into details how to build this. This wasn't like something I designed. I got the information off the internet uh, just like you can. And there's tons of different uh, folks out there that have built these and shown in detail what you need. The last thing you want to do with an unknown piece of vintage audio equipment is to just power it up off the line voltage. You need to either have a Variac, like I used earlier, or you need a dim bulb tester, or preferably you've got both. But this here is pretty inexpensive to build and pretty easy to build. And so this would probably be the first protection item that you could get for your equipment before you went and sprung for a for a uh, Variac, which there are a few more dollars than this costs. So the Variac has its spot, and so does the dim bulb tester. They both have a spot on your test bench. I went ahead and hooked up a CD player, and my little test speaker is here on the test bench, and just gave it a listen, 
just to see if I could hear anything, anything different. I did have both left and right channel. The channel seemed to be pretty much the same strength. They seemed to be pretty balanced. Now I'm going to start to restore the KA5000 too. Get some new electrolytic capacitors in it. Check to make sure there aren't any troublesome transistors. So it looks like there's just four screws. Take the cover off here. Out comes the cover. So that's pretty nice. And now we can see a lot more of the uh, of the circuit boards inside this unit. There's several of them. There's four here, one along here. With the cover removed, I can see the main amp assembly is here in a connector. So that makes that nice. I'm going to go ahead and work on that assembly first because he just looks like the easiest one to get out. And so I'm going to go ahead and remove that now. Looks like it just pulls right out of the connector. And sure enough it does. So that makes that nice to work on because it just comes right out of the connector. And you can see now I'll just move the unit out of the way. Put this right down in front of me on my test bench, the main amp assembly. And I'll be able to uh, work on it easily. Uh, these other assemblies, there's like the preamp and the low and high filter uh, assemblies. As well as the low level uh, assembly. Um, those are not plug-in connector style uh, like this main amp board is. And I'll probably have to maybe loosen up some of these tie wraps to get these in positions to work on them. Maybe not. They look like they're held down with a couple screws, each of these assemblies. And I'll have to remove them and just see what it's going to take for me to... I'll be able to get to those, but for now, I'm going to work on this main amp assembly. The first thing I did was to go to HiFiEngine.com and to download the service manual like I always do. And within the service manual, there's a schematic diagram, and this is the norm for most pieces of equipment. First, I'm going to check on the main amp assembly and see if there are any troublesome transistors, ones that are known to cause issues. After all these years, there's a list of transistors that you can find out on the internet. They're available in a lot of different places. Just do a search on troublesome transistors in vintage audio equipment and you'll find a list somewhere. And there's 10, 15, 20 different transistors that are just known to cause issues and need to be changed if you have any of those in your equipment. So in this case, the main amp assembly didn't have any of those transistors, so I'm going to leave those alone. But as you guys know, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to change out those 50 plus year old electrolytic capacitors. As I've mentioned before, I use a wide variety of different brands. I'm going to use Panasonic and I'm also going to use Elna. As I've mentioned, I really can't, I've never been able to tell the difference between a particular brand of capacitor and another. Uh, some people say they can, and if they can, they can. But I do have several different brands of capacitors, probably six or seven different ones. And I'm just using Panasonic and Elna in this project because I have a good supply of them, and so that's what I'm going to use. So, but if, if the whole thing with the electrolytic capacitors, just buy a good name brand. If you want to use Elna, most of these, matter of fact, all of these electrolytic capacitors in this board are Elna's. Same company that was around in 1970 is around in 2022. I'm going to get started now uh, getting those electrolytic capacitors changed out. I'm also going to use film capacitors. 
for any of the small value electrolytics that are in the signal path. And in this assembly's case, there's two one microfarad 50 volt capacitors that are in the signal path. So I'm going to change those two small electrolytics out with a film capacitor. Now, why do you do this? Well, a long time ago I read that film capacitors sound better than electrolytics. Have I ever been able to hear a difference? I haven't been able to. It doesn't mean there isn't one. It doesn't mean that there's people who can't hear a difference. So if you want to use the exact replacements, the electrolytics that are here, I don't see a problem with it. But I'm going to go ahead and change these two electrolytics, there's one for each channel, with a small um, film capacitor. Now again, I'm using my desoldering tool, which makes this job so much easier. It does such a good job of cleaning out that solder, but not damaging any of this artwork. Even though this board has a stenciling that shows this capacitor, this electrolytic, is being positive on this lead, you always want to verify that. 99% of the time, the stenciling's correct, but every now and then it's not correct. So in this case, it looks like it is correct because the negative lead is here. But you should just take a look at that first before you remove the component. So I'm going to go ahead and start replacing all the capacitors. Soldering, just like desoldering, a lot of your success will be found if you've got a decent soldering iron. If you've got a $3 soldering iron from the flea market, you're probably going to have issues and you're going to do a lot of damage. It doesn't matter who you are. You don't necessarily need to have a HACO soldering iron like I have, even though it's not big bucks. They're $100 or so. Um, but something that's halfway decent, just you know, do a search, get some reviews up on Amazon and find one. You can probably find one for 30 or $40 that will do as good of a job as this soldering iron will. I've got a uh, just a couple left to go here. So I've got the electrolytics changed out. You just want to one more time give it a good look over, especially where you've been soldering and unsoldering. So you just want to give it one more look over and just make sure it looks okay. So now I'm going to work on these four other assemblies that are screwed into the chassis. There's a preamp assembly, there's another assembly called a low level assembly, there's a low filter and a high filter assembly. Before I continue on with this KA5002 restoration and show you all the details and everything that it took to bring this 50 year old amplifier up to date and operating like it was brand new, I'd like to talk to you about the Kenwood Company history. As you guys have seen in many of my recent videos, I've put in the company history and many times I've been able to find that company history that was made by the company itself. You know, whether it was Sony or Pioneer or one of the other companies. They seem to, most of them, have made their own professional video at some point in time. Maybe it was a long time ago. Maybe it was 50 years ago or more. But at least they made a video of their company. And seeing that I deal with vintage stereo equipment, anything in the last 50 years, probably good to go as far as I'm concerned. But in Kenwood's case, I couldn't find anything about them. I couldn't find anything where Kenwood, the company, made a video about their history. I couldn't find anything. I did find one little thing that Kenwood did, but it was it was just something that wasn't worthy of the of the company. So I didn't use that and I just had to do my own research. Had to get out there on the internet and make my own company video for Kenwood. Kenwood was founded by Bill Kasuga and George Aratani in 1961 in California. I always thought of Kenwood as being a Japanese brand, but it was founded in California in 1961. Now it does have 
Japanese roots, and I'm going to go on and explain that. Explaining who Bill Kasuga was and George Arotani may help explain a little bit about how Kenwood was started in California, but how it has a very deep Japanese heritage. Bill Kasuga was born in the United States in 1915, but he was sent to Japan by his father with his siblings when he was three after his mother died in the 1918 influenza epidemic, kind of like our COVID 100 years ago. It killed a lot of people. And so he was sent to Japan and he returned to the U.S. when he was 16 to master English and to finish high school. He went on to earn an economics degree at the University of San Francisco in 1941. But then what happened? World War II, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And what ended up happening to Bill was he was placed in a Japanese internment camp in Arizona in May of 1942. It's kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? But at the time, the United States was scared. You know, we thought the Japanese, even ones like Bill, who were born here in the United States, could be the enemy. So they put him in internment camps. To escape those conditions, he volunteered for the U.S. Army, being fluent in both English and Japanese, to teach language to intelligence personnel. Anybody who could speak Japanese and write Japanese, English just as well, he was, he was well needed. And so he worked with the Army until 1958, long after World War II was over. But he got to the point in his life where he wanted to do something different, some sort of business. He didn't know what he was going to do, but just something. So a friend told him about a and Trading Corporation, which at the time imported Japanese audio equipment for Radio Shack. a and hired him as a sales manager, and three years later, though, he decided, I'm going to go out on my own. And he ended up, in 1961, he co-founded Kenwood, and that was with George Eritani as a distribution company for the Japanese audio manufacturer Trio. And you think, well, how do you get into that? Everything Japanese at that time in 1961 here in the United States, they considered it junk. One of the products that he knew about was Trio, and Trio made high quality products, and he thought he could sell them here in the United States, but he knew he had a big problem. And that was the name. So he knew he needed a name here in the United States to go over well. And that's where he ended up coming up with Kenwood. He didn't know what he was going to use, but he ended up using that name. He picked that because Ken was a very popular name, both here in the United States and in Japan. And it also it worked well with the Kenmore brand which was Sears. At one time, Sears Kenmore, if you had a refrigerator, washer, and dryer, they were top of the line here in the United States. So he wanted something that people might know. And then he added wood to it because it was a hard substance and it echoed Hollywood. What can you say? I bet you they went over a bunch of different names before they came up with that. But that's how Ken Wood uh, came about. There's a lot more ahead, but first a word from our sponsor. I thought I had the best sounding stereo in the dorm till my neighbor got a Kenwood high-speed receiver Before you choose anything else make sure you hear a Kenwood high-speed receiver first I hope it'll sound as good as a Kenwood ah! Only Kenwood has high-speed circuitry high speed reacts fast to every musical note so you get clear accurate sound I think I should have got a Kenwood. Let's get back into the Kenwood company history. As you guys know, I'm mostly into vintage audio equipment. So through the 60s, through the 70s, Kenwood had a lot more input in the audio equipment than most people realize. In the 1960s, 
They were the first to manufacture a solid state amplifier in Japan. I didn't know that. Maybe not have been the first in the world, but it was the first one in Japan. By the time the 1970s came, they were starting to really crank up. Not only in audio equipment, I will make one note here in the United States, they had a large portion of the amateur radio market. This isn't an amateur radio uh, channel, so I'll just leave it at that, but they were involved with more than just audio equipment. What really drove the company forward is they were quite innovative and they really had a lot of great engineers and they spent a lot of money on research and development in audio equipment. They were the first company, for an example, to make the first DC amplifier in Japan. They were the first one to make an amplifier with dual power sources. Uh, 1977, which is right in my heyday, right in my wheelhouse there in my late teens, they were the first company to produce a 40 watt per channel receiver that sold for less than $300, which was a big deal. It broke a pricing milestone, and they sold a ton of them because of that. During the late 1970s, you saw in, in the commercial that I just played, they came out with this patented high-speed amplifiers. Claim to fame is that they reacted almost instantly to high-frequency inputs. The Kenwoods I have sound great. Do they sound better than anything else? I'm not so sure. One thing that Kenwood really, and this may be their amateur radio engineering work, and I'm not really sure of this, but maybe it has something to do with it is their FM tuners were known to be outstanding and they came out with a patented what they called a pulse count detector tuner that helped reduce FM distortion. They were the first ones to introduce variable bandwidth tuning in FM tuners and they narrowed the IF pass band doing that. They weren't just clinger-ons here. They weren't second fiddle to Pioneer or to Sansui or Marantz or any other company. They really had a lot of innovative products. Their tuners were first class. Really their electronics in general were first class. All right, it's time to get back into the restoration of this Kenwood KA5002. And for right now, I've left out that main amp assembly that I just changed out the uh, components on, the electrolytic capacitors, just to give me some more room in here. And You'll see I have this uh, KA5002 up on its side. That's what you have to do with these units. Get them in different positions to work on what it is you're going to try to work on. So I'm going to try to work on this preamp assembly first. There's just two screws holding it. There are pins a lot like this high and low filter assemblies have that go out the bottom of the chassis. So there's wiring hooked to the bottom of this board and really you just got to give it a try and see how much slack you have. I've got to get it out here a little ways to work on it. I may have to take this guy out too to give me a little room. We'll just see how it goes. So first I'm going to start to remove this preamp assembly and just see how much slack I've got in those wires that come out the bottom of the chassis. So I've got the two screws out and I'm just going to see here, as I said, I've already given myself a little bit of slack under the chassis, but it doesn't look like uh, that's going to give me much. But that is what I had to do. I had to flip the chassis over and I was able to get myself, oh, two or three more inches here, but that wasn't enough. So I had to remove the low level um, assembly, loosen it up, had to just remove two screws and loosen it. I'm gonna have to do that anyway to uh, change out the electrolytic capacitors in it. And so I was able to get enough slack here to just set it up here on top. These wires, they'll take some bending, but you don't want to keep going back and forth with them. Just like any wire, take any piece of wire and start bending it, and eventually it's going to break. And that's not the end of the world. If it does break, you can solder it back on, but you just as soon it not happen. 
So it gives you one more uh, spot that you could have a problem. You could break a wire and maybe not even know it and then have to go back in there and find that. So you try to get these assemblies in a position to work on it. And right now I don't even have my uh, desoldering tool heated up so I can kind of carefully here, I don't have to be careful to show you um, that you can get in here. I've got enough room now. I'll have to be careful over here on this side a little bit and the same thing here on this side I'm able to get over here on the component side to remove the components and put in the new ones so I've got enough room here but I just wanted to show you this because this is something that's different on every project you're going to have to move these assemblies around in some manner to get them in a position so you can work on them. So now I'm going to start and uh, get those old electrolytic capacitors out of this preamp board. And also, I believe this preamp board, as I mentioned uh, earlier, i got to check the transistors and see if there's any known troublesome transistors that have to come out of this uh, assembly. So I'll do that too if that's necessary. This preamp assembly has a couple different transistors that are known to cause issues. The 2SC458 and the 2SC871. And from experience I can tell you, you must replace those. Because so many of them have gone bad. And it's not just in this Kenwood. From the 60s through the 70s, these transistors, these are low level transistors, they were used in many different brands of stereo equipment. So this is another reason to download the service manual because the service manual will almost always tell you what transistors are in that particular piece of equipment. And so you don't get it all done, you don't get it all back together, and then you find out, oh no, I've got an intermittent problem. Because a lot of these transistors, they're intermittent. It's not that it doesn't work, it's just a little staticky, a little noisy, a little just something not right. A lot of times it doesn't just punch you in the nose and let you know it's there. It's something you find out over time. So I can just tell you from experience, those are going to go. And if you guys ever run into them in your pieces of equipment while you're restoring them, they got to go with that troublesome transistor sheet. It tells you what you can replace it with, which is a modern transistor that are readily available and they're inexpensive. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to get in there and not only change out capacitors, but I'm going to be changing out transistors in this assembly. <laughs> And once again, you can see how this desoldering tool does such a great job. You know, I'm a little bit tight in here. I've got enough room, but as I said, a little bit tight. But you just touch that desoldering tool on here, hit that button, and that vacuum just sucks the solder out for you. So it just makes this job much easier. And it just comes right on out, the electrolytic that I'm going to change. And as I mentioned before, and I will again, uh, just keep in mind the orientation of these electrolytics. Many times, most of the time, they're correct. The stenciling will be correct, they'll be marked, but occasionally they won't be. But however they come out of the boards, how you want to put them back in. If you do see the stenciling different than the component, don't think the factory did it backwards. Uh, the way it was built was correct. So just make a note of that in your, in your mind before you pull the uh, component out. So I'm going to go through, change out that first electrolytic. I'm going to go through and change these other ones out. No need to show you every single one of those. And then we're going to have to get after those transistors. And so I'll show you how, uh, how I approach changing those out. But first a word from our sponsor.
let's dig into those transistors. As I mentioned earlier, the 2SC871 transistor is a troublemaker, along with his partner, the 2SC458. Both of those transistors need to be changed on site. Fortunately, there's a modern equivalent that will replace both of these quite well, the KSC1845. I wanted to give you all some practical experience about how to approach replacing transistors that you may have in your equipment. The first thing you should do is research if your piece of equipment, see it doesn't have to be like this Kenwood 5002. All the pieces of vintage audio equipment are very similar. They use the technology of the day. The topology, the engineering, the way they built this equipment was very similar, whether it's a Kenwood or a Marantz, a Pioneer, a Sansui, a Macintosh, you name it. They were engineering the equipment with the parts they had available at the time. So you're going to run into these transistors quite often, as I mentioned earlier. And other issues too. It just happens to be these two transistors and this piece of equipment. But there's other issues with transistors with diodes and other components but you, you approach it the same way so what you do first is do a little research great thing about the internet get out there google it google your piece of equipment and find out if there's any issues that you need to be aware of before you start restoring it you'd hate to be in there restoring your unit get it all done and then you find out you leave components like these two bad transistors. And I can tell you from experience, they're all bad or they're all going bad. These transistors have been around 50 plus years. And so it's well documented. These guys are troublemakers and they've got to go. But I wanted to show you how to find a replacement. I showed you that sheet earlier. That's the best way. People have compiled these sheets of troublesome transistors and other parts also. And that's a great help to see if you've got any of these components you've got to worry about. All the data sheets for all these parts are available online. And fortunately, most likely, unless you have a real obscure piece of equipment, there's been somebody that's gone before you and had to figure out what they needed so with doing some searching you can probably figure it out but there are some things that you're gonna have to figure out for yourself and one of the main things with these two transistors and the replacement transistor the leads are orientated differently on the old transistors pin 1 is the base pin 2 is the collector and pin 3 is the emitter now on the replacement transistor pin 1 is the emitter the center pin is still the collector, but the outside pin's the base. So the base and the emitters are reversed. And I'm telling you, you will, if you work on this equipment enough, you'll put them in backwards sometimes. So that's the main thing that you've got to concern yourself with, is orientating these transistors correctly. And usually it means just turning them 180 degrees out. As I said, pin 2, the collector's in the middle. It's in the middle on both the older transistors and on this modern equivalent, but the base and the emitter are reversed. So you just orientate the new transistor 180 degrees out. I know there's some of you out there that already understood how replacement transistors are found and which ones to use, but there's many folks out there that don't understand that. I thought it was important to go over that and to just demystify another part of working on vintage audio equipment. It's not that difficult, I think it was worth a few minutes to try to share with you another piece of working on vintage audio equipment that's not that difficult to do once you know how to do it. Now that I've replaced the electrolytic capacitors in both the preamp and the main amp assemblies, along with those troublesome transistors, what I'm going to do is what I do pretty often when I do my projects. I'm going to hook it up real quick here on the test bench and make sure it's still operating properly. As you guys know, before I started this project, I put it up on the test bench and I made sure I knew what was working and what wasn't working. And so I know if something isn't working now, I did something to it. Whether I broke a wire, put a transistor in backwards, did something incorrectly. So it's well worth my time to get in there. It really takes about five minutes just to hook up a pair of speakers, hook up the CD player, 
and just give it a quick try and make sure that both channels are still working like they were before I started the project. Everything was good, so I continued on with the restoration. Next up is the low level amp. And what that's used for is if you have a low output phono cartridge, like a moving coil cartridge. So that's a really cool feature in this old unit that you can use both a moving magnet or moving coil cartridges, phono cartridges, to go in there and get those old electrolytics out. And this assembly also has two of those 2SC458 transistors that I've, that I've been changing out in this unit. Okay, I've got my parts here uh, sorted. This is usually what I do. I mean, everybody can do it differently, but I'll usually take a look like I did on this low level assembly, see what I needed, kind of get my parts together. Uh, the only thing of note is, again, I'm going to use a couple uh, film capacitors. There's a couple 0.47 microfarad film capacitors that are in the signal path. So I'm going to replace the electrolytic capacitors and I'm going to put in these film capacitors. And what I've done also, I've removed the screws out of the two assemblies that are adjacent to the low level assembly to give me a little bit more room in here. You can see there's some cables in here that are soldered onto the pins. I want to give myself enough room in here when I've got my desoldering tool and my soldering iron so I have less of a chance of hitting any of this wiring here. And what I'm going to do also, do you have to do this sometimes? You just have to make decisions. There's a single red wire that you may see running from the bottom of the chassis and I can't get quite enough slack that I'd like to have. I think if I remove this one wire this is going to come way out this way. The only time to get this low I've level assembly two, updated it like for its next 50 a years. decent amount of slack on those. I'm being held back by this one red wire. And sure enough, once I unsoldered this one red wire, now I've got this little low level assembly way out here now. Much, much easier for me. Now I'll get the low filter and the high filter assemblies all updated. Again, they've got those troublesome transistors in them, along with those 50 plus year old electrolytic capacitors. So I'm going to get those changed out next. Both the low filter and the high filter assemblies have some wires attached to them. Again, on these assemblies, you just got to be careful of those wires when you're using your desoldering tool and your soldering iron. And it ought to be pretty straightforward to get out the old electrolytic the capacitors, the old transistors, and get some new ones in there. After getting the components changed out of the low level assembly and the low and high filter, I'm going to go ahead and just put these back into the chassis. Give them one more look. Make sure everything looks okay on them. Make sure I didn't break a wire or something up in here. I mean, things happen from time to time. So if everything looks good, and I think it does look good, I'm going to go ahead and just mount these back into the chassis. Now I've got all five assemblies I've been working on back reinstalled. The main amp assembly, which was up here. The preamp assembly. The low level assembly. And the low and the high filter assemblies. So I've got them all reinstalled. So now with these reinstalled, I'm able to move on. To the rest of the project so we're getting there getting closer the next assembly i'm going after is the tone board 
which is right here. There's wiring that runs off the tone controls to this assembly. It's got some of those bad transistors as well as a few electrolytic capacitors that need to be changed out. So I'm going to roll this board, draw the same thing. Looks like I've got some slack and you don't really know until you start unhooking it. What you have to remove possibly to be able to get to this assembly. So I'm going to start taking this out. So I'm going to get started with the town assembly and get those old components out of it. You just want to make sure, like when I desoldered that, it felt pretty loose, but maybe not 100%. And I just needed to make sure that these leads were not still soldered to these little eyelets. Because if they're still soldered and you pull on this, there's a very good chance that you'll damage these. And as I've shown before, they can be repaired, but you just as soon not do that. And you've got two choices here. This will come right out, no issues for me. But what you can do, and this makes it easier a lot of times, this one's not bent a lot, but if you use your cutters, you make sure it's loose, which it is, you can see the pins moving, and you just cut these pins right down to the end. So you don't have any of that curvature. And then this thing will fall, just fall right out. Uh, you can pull it out however you want to do it. The whole key is though, just make sure those little eyelets are not still soldered to those pins. So now we can take that old capacitor and it just falls right out in my hand. Okay, I've, I've got the tone amp completed. Changed out those electrolytic capacitors along with four uh, those two SC871s that we've talked about this whole time. And I'm about ready to reinstall it. Now with the tone amp assembly reinstalled, I'll go ahead and move on to the filter capacitors. There's a lot of choices to be made when you're replacing filter capacitors and vintage audio equipment. You can replace the entire filter capacitor, you can restuff the filter capacitor, or you can use under chassis capacitors. Before going on to show you the way I approached replacing these filter capacitors in this KA5002, I just wanted to talk a minute about the products I use to clean the pots, the switches, and the various different moving parts in a piece of vintage audio equipment. Now I use Deoxit products. It's easy for you guys to go out there and do your own research. These aren't the only cleaning products available. I've used them for a lot of years. I've never had an issue. Some people will say some of these don't work or they don't work properly or whatever. I'm not a chemist. I'm not an expert on how one particular lubricant uh, may damage a piece of carbon or may damage a piece of plastic or what have you. But I just want to say from practical experience that these products have worked for me. That's all I can say. So now I'm going to show you what I did in this unit with those filter capacitors. What I'm going to do in this KA5002 is to mount under chassis capacitors to replace the filter capacitors in this unit. This unit has relatively small filter capacitors. They're 2200 microfarad. There's a pair of them. There's also a 1000 microfarad uh, filter capacitor that sits right here. The three of them sit right together. And I believe I've got enough room to get them in there. Look at these guys. These are the replacements. These are 2200 microfarad uh, capacitors compared to the capacitors that are in there. And those are no longer available. That's one of those parts that you can't get an exact replacement for. So to keep the look original, I'm going to mount these under the chassis. And so I'm going to show you how I go about doing that. First, you got to just kind of look at it 
and see what you're dealing with. Do you have enough room here to mount these three capacitors under here? And and I think I do. But the, the trick is, what is the best way to mount these? And everybody's got a different idea. Some people say, oh, you should never use tie wraps. Don't do that. They'll break. Well, this unit's 50 years old, and it's got plenty of plastic in it, even at 50 years old. And most likely, those tie wraps are not going to break. Another option, and I think the option I'm going to use in this unit, is using this bar right here. I don't know how well you can see that. But they, in 1970, when they built this unit, they were still using these before everything went to a circuit board to where all these wires would be running on a board on a, on a land, right? You'd have a trace. They used these in the 60s. Almost all my equipment from the 60s has tons of these in it. This unit here that was built in 1970s got a ton of these bars that they use to run wires point to point. If you need to carry that voltage on or that signal on, you run it another wire off of that pin and you run it to wherever you need to in the chassis. So I'm thinking maybe I can use this. I, I purchased these, oh, about 10 years ago at a local surplus shop. Any way you choose is probably going to be all right. If you want to do the tie wrap method, I see no problem with tie wrapping them. But that being said, using this bar, I'll be able to put at least one screw. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do two. I can always go get my drill, can I? And I can mount this in here with two screws. But either way, it would be mounted with a screw. And the idea is, well, obviously a screw is more secure, right? Most likely, that's never going to come out. These are the three replacement capacitors. I'll be able to do something here. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something with one ones that I, that I have, because I, I'm quite sure I can clear, I'll have a clearance in here, even with my little mount, to, to be able to mount these. I just thought I'd show you in, in this unit, because I think it's a good opportunity to do it. So I'm going to go ahead and click off a few picks here. That's good. That's good. Whoops, hit the camera. Let's see here. That's good. Hopefully I won't get confused, but if I do, I'm not thinking, oh, no, no. Is that the red wire, the yellow wire, the black wire? Where's the diode go? Et cetera, et cetera. So always, always get some pictures with your camera, right? Today's world, or, you know, I'm using my camera. Use your phone. Get pictures. So then if you're confused for some reason, you can go back and see where everything belongs. After doing some just experimenting, putting the caps in there and see where they would fit and where they wouldn't, I went ahead and I broke in half that bar I showed you. It had eight tabs on it. I broke it right down the middle for four tabs. There was no real way for me to get that in there in one piece, I didn't think anyway. So I went ahead and I actually cut two different ones as I needed three separate pieces for the three separate capacitors that I'm replacing under the chassis. I laid it out in a way that looked fairly neat. As I said, there's no right or wrong doing this. You could do it a different way. It doesn't really matter. The idea is just to get a fresh capacitor in there. After getting the three capacitors installed, I went ahead and gave it a try on the test bench, made sure it powered up okay and everything sounded all right. Everything was good to go, so I continued on. Here's something else that I want to talk to you guys about. Here's something that maybe will help you in your restorations. And this is a good unit to talk about this, is trying to figure out values of capacitors. And it can be a little bit confusing sometimes. Now I'm going to replace these capacitors here that are under the chassis also. And these were original. These were originally under the chassis. As you, as you guys probably saw, these have been under the chassis. These were installed under the chassis by Kenwood in 1970. On the capacitor itself is 0 .022 microfarad. Okay, that's pretty conventional. 
All right, I mean, you'd find a capacitor 0 0.022 microfarad. And in this case, they used 630 volt capacitors. Now, why they did that, there's gonna be somebody maybe out there smarter than me that can explain that. Uh, I, I don't see a problem with it, but I don't know what you need a capacitor with a 630 volt uh, rating in this particular uh, Kenwood model. That's something you see a lot of times in, in uh, tube or, or valve based uh, amplifiers, but not so much in a solid state one. So there's a couple of these 0.022 microfarad capacitors that run off the bridge rectifier that sits down here in the bottom of the unit and runs up here to this ground bar. Now, as I said, 0.022 microfarad, just look them up and find them. Well, not all capacitors the ones that I'm actually going to replace them with designate their values the same, in the same manner. It'd be nice if they all were uniform, but they're not. The ones I'm gonna replace them with, these here, which are made by a company called ETR, and they're a Taiwanese company that makes capacitors. I've used them for years. They work fine, and I've used them in a lot of pieces of equipment. And But you look at the designation on this capacitor, and it says 223K, 630 volts. Well, the 630 volts, you can probably figure what that is, but what the heck is 223? And how are you supposed to figure out what is 223? Well, I have a fancy dancy meter also that I can hook up to see what these capacitors actually are. And now it tells me this is a 21.78 nanofarad capacitor. My replacement capacitor has got something called 223K on it, and the capacitors that were original are 0.022 microfarad. They're all designated differently, but these are all the same. Great, Chris, you've got a fancy meter here, so you can do that. I don't have one of those. Well, the great thing in today's world is the internet, and you can look up capacitor codes. They're all the same, and these capacitor codes are available out on the internet. So you don't have to have any real skill to figure it out. You just have to get out there and do a Google search and say capacitor codes, right? 223K, what's the K you're probably thinking? Is that thousands or something? Well, actually the K means it's a 10% tolerance. So, but they're all the same thing. And you may run into some designation sometime that'll say 22,000 picofarads. They're all the same. The average person watching this has no idea you know, what a 223K on a capacitor means. And you don't have to. That's the great thing about today's world with the internet. You don't have to know. <laughs> you can just go look at the uh, capacitor codes. So I wanted to share that with you because that's important. That's just another piece of working on this equipment that demystifies things. It's not that complicated. And so the way I'll insulate these replacement capacitors is similar to what they did. They put a piece of insulating material. I have a little bit of shrink tubing here that I'm going to use. And I'll use a heat gun right here to shrink the tube onto the, um, onto the leads of these new capacitors. And we'll be able to bend these guys a little bit like that. And that should be fine. We'll do to the ground bar because they have both of these together here up to the ground bar. And then they go individually down here to the bridge rectifier. They're usually physically smaller than the vintage capacitors. And you can see in this case they're half, half the size anyway. So if I push that down to about there... It looks pretty good. Let me get this guy even here a little bit better. Yeah, that's better. Now I'm going to use the heat gun. This gets hot. Hot, hot on top of hot. And don't take long.
And there we go. These guys being smaller, they'll actually sit right down in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now I've got the two capacitors soldered to the ground bar up here. Now I'll remove the originals from the bridge rectifier down here. And I'll go ahead and put some insulation on these leads and uh, go ahead and solder them onto the bridge rectifier. I've got the new capacitor soldered onto the bridge rectifier and I'm pretty much done under here. There's one more electrolytic to change out underneath the chassis here and I'm gonna go ahead and get that changed out. With that changed out I have the chassis turned over again and I'm gonna replace the three old electrolytic capacitors that are on the ripple filter and put some brand new ones in there and then I'm gonna move on from there. I'm going to reseat the power transistors in this KA5002. Now getting into all these units, they're all a little bit different, but in most ways they're similar. Now what I'm hoping here, and it kind of looks that way, I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to remove these three screws and I think this plate's going to just come off. I hope so. It'd be nice. So let me just do that real quick. So I've got the three screws out now, and let's see if this plate just comes right off. And boy, it looks awful loose, so I, I think, oh wow, isn't that nice? Take a look at that. Let's see if I can uh, put you over here a second. Let's move you up here for a second here, put you on display. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's got the original NEC uh, power transistors, which is what this Kenwood would have had. 1970. See, I, I just think that's cool. It's over 50 years old, this stuff. And so it's worth just a few pennies to put a new insulator in here and to put some new thermal compound and to just reseat these guys. I mean, they've been in there 52 years. I'm not saying they wouldn't last another 52 just like this, but I'm already here. As I said, it's pennies for the thermal compound, uh, pennies for the mica insulator. So now I'm going to remove the power transistors and reseat them. I've got new mica insulators here, transistor insulators. They're quite inexpensive. Uh, they really cost hardly anything. People say, well, why are you doing this? Well, it takes me about 10 minutes to do these four transistors. To go ahead and reseat them, put a nice new coat of thermal compound in there for them, and they've been in there 50 years, and they'll be ready for their next 50 years. Does it make a difference? Who knows? I know it's not going to hurt them, though. And what you want to do is just two screws that hold these transistors in, and what you see here is really not the transistor it's the transistor case. So you don't have to worry about hurting anything here. The transistor is actually inside this case. There's the second one. And then what you do, as I mentioned, this is just the case, so you don't have, you're not worried about hurting anything. And what you wanna do is squeeze this guy. Sometimes they'll be stuck down there pretty good. And but as again, and again, don't worry about hurting anything here because th this is just the case and you're not going to hurt the transistor at all. So whatever it takes for you to get it out, but just keep working it. You don't want to, you know, you want to take it out fairly evenly so you don't bend the pins. And she's coming. There she comes. I just got her. Old insulator here on the heat sink and that we've got to take off. You can get like a little screwdriver and you see the holes here where the screws were and you can start to work that kind of slowly. You're not going to hurt, we're not going to save this, but the thing is if you go slow hopefully it'll come off in one piece, right? <laughs> so you're not like having to peel it like paint. Let me get my finger in there and then I'm going to get the screwdriver in there. And you don't have to be this delicate. The only reason I'm doing this again, there we go. This will just come off in one piece instead of breaking. This is this is quite thin and it'll break. No big deal, but it's just a neater way to get them, get them off. So we'll put him aside. And what you want to do here with the transistor, I just put a little bit of alcohol 
just to clean that case before we put the new um, thermal compound on it. But the reason you use some thermal compound is these cases are not perfectly flat. And this thermal compound is just messy stuff. <laughs> there's no getting around it. Uh, and there's really no easy way to apply it other than I use my finger. I stick my finger right in it and apply it. I'll set it up here and hopefully I won't drop it down the unit. What a mess that'll be. But the, the key really is not to use too much of it. You just need a little bit. Very, very thin. Much less than you probably think you need. You think you need to put a big coat of it on there. But you don't. I've just done half of it here. And uh, just, just a dab on your finger. You really don't need very much. We've only done it on the one side, the transistor side, to then apply some of your thermal compound onto this side of this insulator. We know it goes this way. Let me put my hand in here. And you can see, I'm getting the thermal compound all over this case. That's okay. I'll wipe that up at the end. But that looks pretty good. Looks like we got a nice little coat down there. We've got a new insulator in there. And she should run nice and cool for the next 50 years. Okay, there's one of them. And now I've got three more. And then we'll be all done with it. Get this one in a little bit. This one in a little bit. And these, this is one of those screws that you want snug. Right? You want to keep tightening each side a little bit, a little bit but you don't want to crank down on these. I also want to mention real quick, even though this wasn't an issue with this KA5002, it is with many pieces of vintage audio equipment. And that is the biasing diodes, like in this particular unit, or sometimes they're biasing transistors. Sometimes you need to remove the heat sink or loosen the heat sink to be able to get to the power transistors. In this unit I didn't have to, but I thought I'd bring this up as it's very important because your unit, you may have to loosen that heat sink for some reason. And the reason I bring that up is because of these biasing diodes that are almost always screwed to the heat sinks. And they'll bust off easily if you're not careful. I just wanted to make you aware that these are on some units and that you've got to remove the screws from those because they'll break right off if you don't. And normally it's going to break the wires right at the diode so you can't repair it. And I make a big deal out of this because this is one of those components that you cannot get. They're not available. And so if you break these, you're in big trouble. It's not that there's not workarounds, but this is something you want to avoid at all costs. <laughs> Is what is the point I'm trying to make. Now what I did was to hook up a turntable, as you guys saw throughout the restoration, starting when I first received the unit. I hooked it up on the test bench, I used a CD player, made sure the left and right channel were working all right, and along the way, and during the restoration, I did the same thing a couple times. I hooked up a CD player, made sure everything was still working, but I never tried a turntable. So, what I did was I brought out one of my turntables. Uh, this particular one has a Denon DL110 moving coil cartridge. As I noted earlier in the restoration, this unit will support a uh, moving coil cartridge, which I thought was very cool, but had to make sure it's working correctly. So I went ahead and hooked that up, and boy, it worked great. I stuck it into Phono 2. I used both the low and the high setting on the Phono 2 switch. Worked great. Boy, did it sound good. I'm pretty confident in the Phono section. I know that the uh, auxiliary section's working, so I think I'm good to go. The only thing I haven't hooked up to it is anything into the tape monitors, but I'll take my chances with that. Before continuing on and bench testing this KA5002, I went ahead and did the alignment procedure in the service manual, which involves checking the DC offset and adjusting it if needed, 
as well as the idle current and adjusting that if needed. Both did need to be adjusted a little bit, but they weren't very far off. I put all the wiring back neatly. I put on the bottom cover. I put on the top cover. And now this K5002 is all set, all done, all ready to start its next 50 years. But first, I'm going to go ahead and bench test it. I've got the K5002 up here on the test bench. I've got my test equipment hooked up to it. I've got my audio analyzer, my sound technology ST3200A. That's this unit here. And I've got a signal generator here. And I've got a couple of load resistors sitting over here. So now I'm going to go ahead. Now I'm just going to warm the amplifier up, let it sit here a little bit. And just looking at it initially, it looks like the channels are well balanced uh, with the volume control. They're never going to be 100%, but right now I'm showing like, uh, oh, about uh, just, over a, just over a watt on the left channel, 1.05 watts, and the right channel is 1.08. That's close. Not going to get it any closer than that. So I'm going to let it sit here and warm up a bit. Maybe what I'll do here real quick though, maybe what I'll do is just take a look at the distortion. 0 0.0319. That's 0 0.0319, not 0 0.3. Uh, this amplifier uh, has a spec of uh, 0.5%. So that is quite low, 0 0.03. This is the right channel here, so 0 0.02. I mean, once again, uh, the spec is 0 0.5. That's um, that's really quite low. Pretty amazing, really. I'm surprised it's that low at a watt. So now I've got both channels running just under uh, 5 watts a channel. 4.65 and 4.68. The unit itself, she's warming up some. I can feel it. I can feel the heat over here. The heat sinks are kind of here, off here on this side, and uh, I can feel it. Let's just see what we got here now as far as distortion goes. 0 0.03. That's really low. I mean, it really is for a unit from 1970. Over here on the A channel, which is the left channel, let's go to the right channel. It's 0 0.023. I mean, that's just, it's just, outstanding. But that's one of the things that I really love about this vintage equipment is it was so overbuilt and so they underpromise. You know, they didn't overpromise. They didn't say something would do it and then it wouldn't do it because back then, that's the thing I hate about today's equipment. You look in the manual, there's hardly any 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 specifications. And if there are specifications, there's hardly anybody testing the stuff. You know, I used to like that, you know, look at stereo review or audio or high fidelity or whatever and have somebody go in there and go through it. And, and when something didn't meet specs, they, were, they got a hold of the manufacturer, right? If this amplifier was sitting on a desk at stereo review back in 1970 and they had some kind of issue, they were on the horn to Kenwood. And Kenwood was on the horn back to them, right? And saying, well, you've got a defective unit or some other issues going on. So, I mean, that's what I loved back in the day. They actually tested this stuff. And I think the manufacturers knew they were going to test it. So a lot, a lot of times they made sure the unit would do what they said it would do. It's a gorgeous little amp. I mean, I look at it here, I think, why would you need anything else? And, and then I look around, think, well, I got a lot of other stuff, don't I? But this would be a great little amplifier for anybody who's trying to get into vintage audio, or a second system, something you don't have to spend a ton of money on, but they just need to be gone through and, 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 and restored. Like I showed in the video, you know, they just need a little work. And this thing, I, I, I almost guarantee it'll be around another 50 years. <laughs> it'll be on somebody else's test bench or out in their garage or something. All right here, I'm on the uh, left channel. I'm gonna just crank it up some. Let's just see what happens here. Let's crank it up a little bit. I've got just the left channel here. Uh, it's showing the wattage over here on this side, about six watts right now. And over here is the distortion, and it's 0 0.03. Um, 
you, you know, I, I'm, I'm really surprised how low the distortion is. And again, I'm just running right now uh, a uh, thousand hertz sine wave into it. And uh, I'll go through and test various frequencies and I'll do a sweep test and I'll do that stuff. But really, this is a good basic test. If it makes it through this test here, just a single sine wave and look good as far as holding the power and holding that distortion down, most likely the rest of it's, it's just going to slide right through it. So, while you guys are watching here, I'm gonna I'm gonna start keep, I'm gonna keep turning this volume control here. Just staying quiet. <laughs> Let's get up to 15 or so. And look, 0 0.04. I mean, come on. You know, I mean, incredible. It's rated at 0 0.5. 0.5. I mean, right now it's half of 0.1, right? 0 0.04. Incredible. I'm going to go over to the B channel, the right channel, and see uh, what he's got to say. Man, 0 0.03. Now well, I've got it there, I'm going to turn this some more. Let's get up to about 20. Break 20. There we go. How's she feel over here? Feels warm. <laughs> what a surprise, right? If you're running 20, uh, if you're running, um, if you're running 20 watts uh, continuous, um, you're uh, way beyond what this amp would be running, right? Because you'd have peaks where it'd be clipping. It's only a 30 watt per channel amp, but I'm just letting it sit here, and I really have a lot of confidence. I could go off, get something to eat, get something to drink, come back, and this will be fine be able to go to bed and come back, it'll be fine. <laughs> it's sit here all night. It might get warm, but it, it would uh, it would be fine. Yeah, I can feel it. Just let her run here for a few minutes. I'm not gonna let it run forever. And then we'll take it up and see what she actually clips at. 24, 26, look at that distortion. 0 0.04, <laughs> that's crazy, just is. 0 0.05. We're almost to 30 watts. We're at 31. 32. Well, 35, I'm stopping. I'm sorry. I'm not gonna go above 35. Distortions rose up to 0 0.06 at 35. So as you can tell, I was really impressed with this KA5002 on the test bench. And now it's time for me to listen to it. And I'm going to see what it sounds like. Well, this KA5002 did not disappoint when I hooked it up and listened to it for a while. I listened to both uh, CD. I listened also to the uh, phono section. And also I have a uh, blue sound. And so I did a little bit of streaming through it. And boy, it's outstanding. I hooked it up to a pair of uh, quite efficient speakers. Uh, they were my Definitive Technology STLs. They have built-in subwoofers, and, and those speakers get along with the smaller amps like this one just as well as the bigger amps. It wasn't overwhelming anywhere, but it wasn't underwhelming either. It was just a nice little amp, and you could sit down with a beverage and enjoy it for a couple hours. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up down below. For you non-subscribers, I'd really appreciate a subscription. And for my present subscribers, as always, thank you so much. You all have a good day.